Old Report Center in Hull, which is a major new center for the study of this great funding, um, most of the public. Um, and uh, at, that, at that event, the keynote, in effect, was by the president of Ghana. It was a very interesting event. Uh, we couldn't get the president of Ghana, so we got Lonnie. <laughs> and I think we did pretty well. <laughs> uh, Lonnie, thanks for a, a great send-off to this conference. We're going to take about a 20-minute break. There's coffee and whatnot upstairs. I'm going to urge you back here in about 20 minutes. And all of you who are standing, there are plenty of seats, as you can see, when we come back. About 20 minutes. Most importantly for this conference, the book called Slavery and Public History, The Tough Stuff of American Memory. Jim Walvin may be the UK's equivalent of Jim Horton, or maybe just slavery, written numerous books on slavery and the slave trade, including, uh, including years of co-editing the journal, Slavery and Abolition. Um, but he has also now become a major uh, player in the, in the public history of slavery in the UK and is, in effect, uh, chairman of the many processes and many places uh, <coughs> through which, by which, the UK is commemorating the end of the slave trade in 07. He is also the curator of the, of the British Parliament's exhibition, The Abolition of the Slave Trade. Mari Haredi uh, has worked for the Norwegian UNESCO Commission since 1989. She was Secretary General of the Norwegian UNESCO Commission uh, for a decade, from 93 to 2003. She was a founder of the UNESCO Slave Trade Teaching Education Project, which was founded on three continents, uh, trying to bring together uh, especially secondary teachers from all over the world and to help them learn how to teach about the slave trade. In the United States, we now have at least five or six sites, uh, universities or, or museum sites, that are involved in this international project. And the Guild Learning Center here is, is one of those five or six. In fact, next summer, we're hosting the annual conference for teachers from all over the United States for a week uh, here in New Haven. She's been an educational reformer and a curriculum development person in Norway and Denmark for many years. And I'm very fond of saying she was also a gymnasium teacher and a high school teacher for several years, which I was as well. And Barbara Chase Ribode is, among many other things, a prize-winning poet, author of five novels, including Sally Hemings, uh, a second novel called Valide, a novel of the harem, and a novel called Echo of Lines, which was based on the Amistad mutiny. She's also the author of the novel The President's Daughter, which was a kind of <coughs> prequel to the novel Sally Hemings, and of the, the the work of fiction, Venus Hottentop, which won the 2004 American Library Association Prize for the Best American Novel. She was knighted by the French government. She grew up in Philadelphia, and lives in both Rome and Paris, and she was commissioned to construct the monument for the African burial ground in New York City, um, and that work called Africa Rising is currently on display at the U.S. Federal Building in Lower Manhattan. And she is also a Yale University graduate. She's currently writing a novel entitled Central Park. I will leave it at that, but I will be a ferocious timekeeper, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to open it up. Jim Horton first. Um, I want to say first that as, as Ronnie laid out for us, this is in many ways for historians to aid in public history. You know, I grew up in a generation where historians were busy doing what was called the new social history. That is, we were giving voice to the voiceless, writing history from the bottom up, and all that kind of stuff. And all of that really has made an impact on the university, but mainly it has stayed within the university. Now, this generation that uh, we have before us has as their responsibility to take that social history and make it available to the wider public. And that is, in many ways, much more difficult than the generation of my job, uh, of, of, uh, that, that my uh, generation had. And it is more difficult because some of this history, as Lonnie pointed out, is not a history that many in the public want to deal with. Now, Lonnie, uh, obviously, is talking from the standpoint of the museum world. And I want to uh, just uh, add to something he said by telling you um, how important 
museum exhibitions are to the general education of the American public. Roy Rosenzweig and David Thalen wrote a book some years ago entitled The Presence of the Past. And in that book, they actually surveyed the American public and asked this question, what sources of history do you most trust? Realize that 80% of those people interviewed said, we trust historical museums. That's amazing, because only 50% said we trust university historians. <laughs> and only about a third said we trust the high school teachers. So that if, if in fact museums are the places where Americans are getting the history that they trust, obviously it is incumbent upon those museums to provide the best in terms of the history available. But that is, uh, as, as we all know, in many ways not an easy job, and especially when you're talking about something as controversial as the institution of slavery. Now we have many examples of places where slavery exhibits that were really good, really informative, would really have educated the public, never got exhibited. I'll give you an example. Back in the big house, which was supposed to be established on, on display at the Library of Congress, we really never got built at the Library of Congress, not subsequently with other places. I'm talking about John Blatch's exhibit a few years ago. Uh, but it never was exhibited at the Library of Congress because about slavery is. Talk to people in the National Park Service. Talk to John Latcher, who would say the only, he didn't say the central, he said one of the important causes of the Civil War. And 1,100 people wrote to the Secretary of the of the interior demanding his resignation because obviously this man didn't know what he was talking about if he said that slavery was one of the most important causes of the Civil War. Uh, back in 1998, Governor James Gilmore, uh, <coughs> governor at that time governor of Virginia, instituted what lots of Southern governors do on a routine basis, um, Confederate History Month. April is generally Confederate History Month. But in 98, he made it clear that Confederate History Month that he wanted to celebrate, he wanted the state of Virginia to celebrate, was a Confederate History Month which did not glorify the institution of slavery. He said, what we want to understand is that the Civil War brought slavery to an end. And he talked about the, the, the slavery as being an inhumane institution. Now, you would have thought at the end of the 1990s, that would partly have been a controversial thing to say. However, he got all kinds of letters, some of them public letters, decrying his diminishing comments about the institution of slavery. Let me I'll quote you a little bit from a letter that was sent by R. Wayne Byrd, who was head of the Virginia Heritage Association, when he said that the governor didn't understand what slavery was and that it was a relationship within the family where slave and master had a this is a quote, genuine family concern. What he was talking about is illustrated, I think, not the 1990s, in which the South was trying to make clear the genuine family concern that slaves and slave masters had for one another. Now, it is interesting that um, this cartoon finds its way into the comments still legitimate enough, at least in the minds of some, to be publicly printed in a major state newspaper. So the point I'm trying to make here is that part of the reason that slavery is hard to deal with is because the issues that slavery um, are still with us in many, many ways. There are lots of people who are trying to do what Wani suggested uh, and uh, what was suggested to him, to Mr. Johnson, that he talked about, that is, to remember slavery. There are lots of people today who are trying to remember slavery. It is a difficult thing to do. But in some places, it is being done, and being done with a reasonable degree of success. Let me talk just a few minutes about the efforts to remember slavery that have been in the 70s been going on in colonial Williamsburg. You know, when I went to Colonial Williamsburg in the early 70s for the first time that I had been there, there were African-American people all around the place. They were at the cafeteria. They were sweeping up, and they were serving things, and they were washing dishes. 
I did not realize at that time, which is something that you can't miss now if you go to Williamsburg, and that is that African Americans represented at least half of colonial Williamsburg population, yet they were not pictured in the presentations of colonial Williamsburg until Rex Ellis and a number of, of those who worked with him in the late 1970s instituted a program which went under the name the Other Half Tour. That is, they provided uh, an effort, an opportunity of people to understand the life in Williamsburg from the point of view of the other half. One of the things they set up was a plantation, Carter's Grove, which is a recreation of a plantation which, which actually existed and populated by costumed interpreters who would tell you the story of slavery as it went on in the 18th century in Colonial Williamsburg. I talked to some of these people who were doing these kind of costume reenacting, and they told me some interesting things about their jobs. One of the persons, uh, one of the people I talked to was a man who told me that it was difficult for him to leave the grounds in his Williamsburg costume. Now see, when white reenactors left the grounds to go to lunch at the local McDonald's or uh, the Pizza Hut and so on, uh, people would say, oh my goodness, you work at Colonial Williamsburg. That must be really interesting. But when African Americans, costumed as slaves, left the grounds, they were often mistaken for homeless people. They were often refused service. They were often they often got comments from people as they passed by in cars because somehow they were mistaken for 20th century people. Now, one of the stories. <laughs> but one, one of the stories that um, uh, in fact many people know this story. When these reenactors were first beginning to do their reenacting for the public, they were told never break character. That is, if somebody asks you something about the 20th century, don't act as if you understand that. Always stay in your, your 18th century character. Well, African Americans had trouble. So much trouble that, for example, at one point, an irate visitor wrote a letter to the local newspaper complaining about the fact that Colonial Williamsburg was keeping slaves. In the 20th century, you know, keeping slaves who couldn't make the leap between a costume reenactor and a slave. I'm not sure what that tells us about American society, but I suspect it says something important. There's something important about the connection between what has and what is, what has happened, what has been, and what is. I also talked to people who participated in one of the most controversial aspects of recent presentation at Colonial Williamsburg, and that is the slave auction. That is an auction in which they who took part in that auction told me these are black people who were actors, who were thoroughly conversant with the history. They really understood the history very, very well. They had read for weeks and even months to prepare for this role. But what they told me was, they said, you know, but nothing can really prepare you for standing on that stage and watching a person go through the motions of selling another person. And apparently that was a major issue that they had difficulty dealing with, about the extent to which these issues are still very much with us, especially emotionally. So much so that you get reactions to here. The, the establishment of a statue of Abraham Lincoln in Richmond, Virginia. That was tremendously controversial. So controversial, as a matter of fact, the Klan showed up. The Ku Klux Klan showed up to protest. You know, the most non-threatening statue. <laughs> this is Abraham Lincoln sitting on a bench with his little son, Ed. I mean, this is not a threatening statue. Yet for some people in present day Richmond, Virginia, this was a statue that was too threatening. A statue that they could not really abide. Incidentally, I should point out that uh, there is 
the kind of reactions. Go on the web sometime and look up Southern Heritage Association. You can look up by individual state names, Georgia Southern Heritage Association, and so on. They argue that there are people, there are especially, these people are led by black politicians. This is a mock, oh, this is a, a, a mock-up picture of Al Sharpton. Now, obviously, Al Sharpton never wore that. But this, this is a picture that appears on their website that illustrates to them and the people they want to create that there is a heritage war going on, a heritage war being waged by black politicians and various members of the <laughs> various members of the what they call what they call the black heritage war against southern the southern past. Well, obviously none of these things are, none of these things are valid in any way except in the minds of some of these people who think who see themselves as fighting the war for their for the preservation of their heritage. Now, sir, I think to make it clear that to talk about slavery is serious business, that this is something that affects deeply the emotions of people in so many places in this country. This is a confrontation between history and heritage. Heritage is that personal thing, that thing that gives so many people personal connections to the past, through their family, through people they know, and, and incidentally, through their, helps them to define themselves in, within historical context. And they see themselves as being threatened by historians who bring history. There are people who will give you all kinds of arguments about the confrontation between heritage and history. And of course, this history, that is the history of slavery, is so central because it is the fundamental American contradiction. How else do you explain at the beginning of a country where there are these sacred words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and what are these rights? Life liberty in the pursuit of happiness, and how do you explain that the person who put those words on the table was holding 150 people in slavery at the time he wrote the words? Great American contradiction. This great American contradiction which has gone on. Incidentally, as I said earlier, it's the, the invention of race theory that was an attempt to try to rationalize <coughs> this contradiction didn't work, except that it has affected all of us, and so when we think of Slavery and its impact on American society understand that the justification for slavery was a justification for Jim Crow. And the justification for slavery was a justification of what we call racial profiling. And the justification for slavery is the reason that if you're black in Washington, D.C., you have a hard time getting a cab after dark in today's society. So that that justification is still with us. And one further point. Part of what we need to unsure racial lines that developed during slavery are still working themselves out in today's society. You want to know how slavery affects us as Americans, understand that slavery that made this slave master and that slave come to grips with their relationship over the lifetime, you know, this is an 18 month old slave master. How does that slave master realize that at some point their surrogate mother is also their property? Now it's that kind of psychological and emotional impact of this institution that we don't understand, but has helped to build what we call Southern society, and insofar as Southern society has become American society, and insofar as we are all socialized by American society, it has helped to make us who we are. That's the role of museums in today's society who present the issue of slavery. That is, to help every single American understand that they are, <coughs> that slavery is implicated in their lives. That they are in part what they are because of what slavery made the society in which they were socialized. We all have African American history insofar as that history is tied to the institution of slavery. After all, African American history is American history made by Americans in America. I don't have time to tell you how economically, politically, and socially slavery was, 
But let me just say that uh, in the question and answer period, we can certainly talk about this. This presentation of slavery is, I think, important because it will help us Americans to understand ourselves in ways that we have never understood ourselves before. And in that regard, it will help us to understand our country in ways that we have never understood our country before. Slavery is America's most un-American history. We need to come to grips with that fact and understand that even though it was un-American, it helped in very important ways to build America. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, and as I mentioned when I was here last week, uh, one of the most extraordinary <laughs> moments in my teaching career was at a center sponsored event in Williamsburg in, I think it was 99, uh, to look at the CD-ROM on the <coughs> slave trade, which Cambridge University just published. And I made a point of sitting throughout the sessions in rooms filled with high school teachers. And what was really quite extraordinary was the degree to which the uh, transmission of highly technical uh, academic research was passing quickly into American high schools via these uh, high school teachers who were actually working closely with academics who themselves at the edge of whatever research is being done. It was a quite extraordinary few days, but all made possible by Gilda Lerman. The strides have been made in transmitting <coughs> what is a, a, a sometimes a very rarefied form of knowledge into high schools. It's really quite extraordinary. When I first decided to speak in public about the kind of issue that I'm talking about today, it was actually in Jamaica about seven years ago. And when I um, finished, a young woman stepped out of the audience, a young Jamaican woman, said of the audience, said, um, Professor Walbert, it's very nice to see you. I thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know time marches on, but um, I didn't think we look back at that. Um, but of course, what she'd done, she'd read something I'd written in 1970, which was for a young person. That might as well be written in the, the, the end of the Middle Ages. <laughs> what I'd like to do, really, is not to, uh, is in, a, in a way, to talk about what's going to happen in Britain in 2007. I'll also touch on as a form of discount and sometimes I've had a critical uh, engagement with some of the points that Lonnie made this morning, some of the questions that came up, because there are some quite extraordinary things taking place in Britain at the moment. I used to say, and it's, uh, it's an old uh, uh, joke, really, that if someone told me the world's going to end tomorrow, come and live in Britain, because things happen 50 years later there. <laughs> <laughs> but that is simply not the case. And there are things that are happening in Britain that I suspect might not be able to happen here. For instance, the Department of Education is about to announce that the teaching of slavery in the slave trade uh, will become part of the compulsory curriculum for all high school teachers uh, studying in Britain. Now, whether that will be possible in the United States, I don't know. I'll leave that for you to guess. But that is about to be announced. Uh, the Home Office, the major organ of state next to the Foreign Office, uh, has just issued this pamphlet, a call, reflecting on the past, looking to the future, about 2007. Lonnie's point about not merely engaging with the past, Britain's slave past, but thinking of its consequences for the way we think of the future. Interestingly enough, if you look at the illustrations, the iconographic presentation on the front, there are three pictures. One, of the great slave ship, the Brooks, which became the kind of the standard, really, image of how abolitionists portrayed the horror of the slave ships, which is not a uh, without its problems in terms of interpreting slavery. The picture of Equiano, which we now know of us, is not the picture of Equiano, <laughs> but the picture of one of his mates. And a picture of a man that we know, indeed, who he is, and that is William Wilberforce. To the British, of course, the issue of abolition is so bound up with Wilberforce that if you wander around Westminster Abbey and look at who we have memorialized, we being the Brits, who we memorialized, <coughs> it is, of course, the parliamentary and uh, politicians who campaign against the slave trade, but not much mention of uh, the victims of the insulin. Um, now, because the British are pretty good at remembering their past, they very often have these kind of annual commemorations, Nelson and Trevelga a couple of years ago, uh, Young Cloud, Young Cloud of Plot in 2005, you know, that was a tremendous success, it was the first major exhibition that Parliament had in Westminster Hall, which is where um, parliamentary uh, celebration of abolition is going to take place. That may be, of course, something to do with you. Come back, Guy Fawkes, all is forgiven. You don't know what we're trying to do. But I was trying to chop down a list of all the institutions in Britain that are going to do something about 2007. Parliament is, and I'll come back in a second, um, the British Museum, 
founded by a man whose money came by about marrying the widow of a, a great Jamaican planter. Um, the National Gallery, uh, the, the, the National Archives in Kew are not going to, for all kinds of funny reasons, the Royal Mint is going to issue a special coin, a two pound coin, but the picture is of the supplicant slave on their knees begging for freedom. Again, not unproblematic. There would be a special issue by the Royal Mail of six stamps to, to commemorate abolition. Uh, which pictures you're going to put on there. Uh, but again, I ask you, uh, these are major steps, really, for the British state to engage itself in how it thinks about the slave trade and how it thinks about um, abolition. When this whole question came up in Parliament, should we commemorate abolition? It was on the back of the belief, that it was being argued by a number of historians, that the Act of 1807 to end the slave trade, not slave trade, but the slave trade, that this was one of the most important acts that the British Parliament passed up to that point. And if that's the case, then Parliament ought to say something about it. However, the question is, what does that act represent? When I was drawn into this, and the, the, the line management of a parliamentary system is so complex, you, it, I, I really couldn't describe it. You have both houses of commons, you have government, you have the speaker, you have a, a monarchy, all involved in a very, very peculiar relationship. Um, and the decision in uh, 2005 to have a gunpowder plot exhibition was so successful they decided, let's do something for 2007. But of course, not realizing just how problematic 1807 was. What is that act? Well, it is an act of parliament which is written in vellum in the tower of Victoria Tower in, pa uh, in the Palace of Westminster. I looked at it two weeks ago, the real thing. Uh, but that's an act of parliament. How did that act of parliament come into being? And once you're into that debate about how you talk about an act, then you're into interesting debates about the history of Britain. Because the point I made when they asked me would I advise them on this is that this Act of 1807 is not really an act that stands alone. It's not a kind of an abstraction, a piece of vellum that's interesting. It represents a quite extraordinary seismic shift in British opinion and policy and economics, as we heard earlier. But here is something that's a kind of crossroads of major British change. But the point I made right at the beginning. And this really touches upon one of the questions about British triumphalism, which I suspect is not going to happen for all kinds of complex reasons. But in 1807, the British turned their back on something which they had perfected. If you're going to talk and commemorate the Abolition Act of 1807, you've surely got to remember what went before. And what had gone before was that the British in this previous century had carried the best part of three and a half million Africans across the Atlantic, British ships and British colonial ships, and maybe North America. But three and a half million Africans travel across the Atlantic in British, effectively in British ships. Now, where, do you, where does that fit in the story of the Abolition Act of 1807? It's got to be incorporated. Equally, the other factor which, when we, we first got together, we had thought about was um, what about the African voice? What about African resistance? What about the black presence in Britain? That's going to be one of the first items as you walk into the slave, into the slave trade exhibition. What about public opinion? In, 18, in 1787 through to 1807, there was the most quite extraordinary outburst of feeling about the slave trade in Britain. And we can log that, we can register it, because the petitions that were signed by tens of thousands of people are still there in the House of Lords Record Office, above the House of Commons. And we're using the, the petition from Manchester in 1787, which rolls out the width of this room, signed by all sorts of conditions of people, Working people, middle class people, people of sensibility, and they did exist in Manchester in the 1780s, um, and by poor people, and by women, large numbers of women. Here is a document that speaks not merely to what happened in the ending of the slave trade, but how the British edged very slowly towards believing that something was wrong here, and that perhaps there were other economic ways of doing things. It is an extraordinarily complicated story, but it's one which actually you can wrestle with and actually use, not really as a, an illustration of 1807 itself, but also a way of looking backwards to what made the British what they were. And many of the points that were made this morning are so deeply embedded in British life that it needs to be scratched away before you notice it. Who would think, I mean, what, at the point I made before, what could be more British than a sweet cup of tea? But who drew the sugar to make that tea palace? It was the Africans in Jamaica and Barbados. What could be more characteristic of an 18th century social scene than the clouds of smoke coming in a coffee house, 500 of them in London, in let's say 1750? But who drew the tobacco that made that tobacco smoke? Of course, it was the Africans in the Chesapeake. Now, sitting in London, sitting in Manchester or York, it seems a long way away. And this is really the kind of the conceit, really, of British history. That here, try to think of yourself thinking of this on the other side of the Atlantic. Slavery is viewed 
There's an issue that is over there, that is foreign, that is exotic. It's in the Atlantic, it's in the Caribbean, it's in North America, it's in Africa. It's nothing to do with the British. In fact, it is so integral to British experience that it tells you as much about the British as it does about Africa or the Americas. The British became what they were and what they are on the back of this quite extraordinary system. The difficulty of engaging with that and incorporating what looks like exotic areas of history into mainstream British history is the issue that most British historians, as simple professional historians, have not faced up to. The comparison I make is that academic historians, we're all specialists, but they're like many even strip farmers. They've been up and down this damn street <laughs> you know, for 40 years of their career, and they've not noticed what's going on. You're a British historian, you're an Americanist, you're a Caribbeanist, and it's very hard to integrate these. 2007 offers British historians and the British people an opportunity to look very critically at their past, not merely at the passing of their act. But it's also worth remembering, and this is something the exhibition will do, is that 1807 is not the end of the story. Slavery continues in British possessions. And indeed, in the form of anti-slavery international, the modern-day descendant of the organization of the 1820s, it still exists. Anti-slavery international campaigns against slavery the world over to this very day from South London, where it has this wonderful archive going back to the 1820s. <laughs> slavery continues long after the British end 1807. When I was talking about this in Ghana last year, the African students said, don't come back about the British bonnets and the slave trade. You think of what the Europeans did to Africa in the years after the abolition of the slave trade. You think of, say, the Belgians in Congo or the British in Kenya, etc., etc. All of that. So that 1807-2007 is a very interesting opportunity in which academic historians can engage, not merely in this coming together of the explanatory force really, that shape a, a particular act of parliament, but he also is a kind of people into the way the British became what they were. And that really is the story that's to be told. There is one final point I'd like to make, and that is that it's going to be held in this wonderful late medieval building, Westminster Hall, part of the Palace of Westminster. But we, I hadn't realized that I joined this extraordinary thing, but they, they have what they call a two-hour rule. Everything in there has to be removable within two hours, in case the monarch dies, because she's laid out in state there. <laughs> um, so, as, you know, we all have every good reason to say, you know, long live the Queen. <laughs> but my, my initial idea, not only to have Wilberforce and his friends and pop their and the Africans on one side, and Elizabeth II laid out on the other, should that happen, is can you imagine the extraordinary viewing figures we get? <laughs> but that was regarded as very, very bad taste. <laughs> Finally, let me urge you. Let me urge you to go and see it from May to September, Westminster Hall next year. And knowing Americans, you know, I know you'll make care of your dollars, and the dollars are bad check, it's free. Thank you. <laughs>